Hi folks, Matt Easton here, Scholar Gladiatoria. So, if there was one thing that I was consumingly obsessed with when I was a teenager, it was late medieval armour, particularly 14th and 15th century armour. I swung between kind of late 14th and mid 15th century, but one of the things that I found when I was pouring through all of these books on armour, and it has to be said a lot of the books about armour that were available when I was a kid back in the 90s, were books that had been written decades before and some of them were quite out of date and when I was looking for up-to-date um, research and pub publications on armour, I found that lots of books just repeated the same old stuff that Claude Blair had written back in the 1950s. Um, and uh, in actual fact, when I was at university um, at the end of the 90s and up to the year 2000 when I graduated, I was researching during my archaeology and history degree, I was researching 14th century armour, but also 13th century armour to an extent, and I wrote my degree dissertation on the development of the coat of plates, and I found uh, Benk Thordeman's work was pretty much the, the go-to work, and that was written, if I remember correctly, in 1939. So, <laughs> for those of us who are really obsessed with armour and just want to read about armour, um, there just wasn't very much available back then. In the last two decades there's been a lot more written and it has to be said some of this I think has been thanks largely to the um, to the internet but also the, the growing recreational movements that have required more information about armour, you know, reenactment, jousting, SCA, Battle of the Nations, uh, HEMA, all of these things where there's more and more people interested in the real nuts and bolts of how you know how this stuff worked and and the history of how it developed and they're pouring over books and they're consuming books at a higher rate than than before thankfully um so i think there is a bigger demand for it now than simply the old osprey books and stuff like this that were available back in the 90s that just repeated in fact a lot of rubbish some of them um that had been written decades and decades before but one of the leading lights in the study of armour in the last couple of decades has been Dr Tobias Capwell, also known as Toby Capwell. He is the curator of arms and armour at the Wallace Collection and regular viewers of my channel, you will know Toby or Tobias very well um, because of course I've done a series of, of um, films with him and in fact um, I'm soon intending to do some more and hopefully that will be an ongoing thing. He uh, a few months ago, I believe it was about six months ago now, maybe a little bit more, published a very large work, it's not his first book, but he's published many things in the past, but this is his first really big book um, that he's published, and this is called Armour of the English Knight 1400 to 1450. You might say, why 1400 to 1450? Well, quite simply, because there are two more books coming um, in this series, and I'm sure he's working on other books as well in other series, um, but there is going to be another book, Armour of the English Knight 1450 to 1500, and then there's going to be a third book, as I understand it, plans might change, um, but there's going to be a third book which deals with armour in England between 1400 and 1500, so the 15th century, um, that is imported armour. For example, the Earl of Warwick, the famous um, effigy of the Earl of Warwick, shows what's pretty much a typical um, Italian harness at the time. It's not an English armour. So what Toby's book really focuses on, and I'll show you inside this book in a second, is English armour of 1400 to 1450 in this case. And it's specifically English, so English design, English um, made armour. And um, this is the product, essentially, uh, the, the nucleus of this work started when um, Dr. Capwell was doing his, uh, his PhD. And his PhD thesis was based on showing that there was a distinctive English style of armour present in England in the 15th century. And as a course of doing that PhD, he documented, I think I remember correctly, he said about like 300 and something brasses and effigies from around England. But he spent a lot of his PhD going to churches uh, and, and um, collections and archives, basically trying to find the biggest uh, assemblage that he possibly could of available brasses and effigies and compiling them and then looking, looking, putting them into categories, um, typologies essentially, and, and trying to see how this compared to continental armour. How did this compare to German and Italian armour, perhaps even, you know, French and Spanish armour. German and Italian armour, which is the type of armour that survives the most in museum collections, 
Um, it is of very specific types, but if you look at manuscripts, for example French or Burgundian or Flemish manuscripts, or indeed Spanish manuscripts, you see types of armour that are different to what you see represented amongst the surviving, most of the surviving armour, which is, tends to be Italian or German. Um, so I was sort of, I did have a hunch um, that English and French armour was different to, to the mainstream of Italian and, and German armour of the 15th century. And essentially Toby's work, and obviously I, I talked to Toby about this uh, over many, and he uh, gave lectures that I attended and all this kind of stuff. Um, and uh, he con confirmed this and elaborated on it and uh, it is essentially he's made it very very clear that there was a distinctive style of English armour and not only that, not I mean that in itself might not be a very in interesting fact but it has all sorts of ramifications for uh, how we look at the English uh, and England in the medieval period, in the period of the, the Wars of the Roses and, and the end of the Hundred Years War because um, of course it means that the English felt that they needed or wanted a distinctive style of armour, um, or indeed that there was a native armour making tradition, which we now know that there was. So it has all sorts of other historical ramifications, and um, one of Toby's theories, and I would be inclined to agree with it, is the very distinctive way of fighting of English armies of that period, which was on foot, was to essentially fight most of the time defensively on foot supported by lots of archers, may indeed have dictated the type of armour that they chose to wear. Was there a big difference between French armour and English armour? I think there was less of a difference between French and English armour, um, but there probably were differences and there are things that we see in French brasses and, and effigies from this time that we don't really see in English effigies. Um, for example, the presence of very large pauldrons quite early on in the Agincourt period and just after about 1420. We don't really see that very much on English armours. But anyway, to the actual book, it is big and yes, it's not a particularly cheap book, but I think it's worth every penny of it um, because frankly these kind of books don't come around very often and if you're even remotely, if you've got any interest in medieval armour you'll probably learn more from this book than you will from any other book about armour except perhaps for Claude Blair's European armour book but you should get that as well, you should get that and get this um, and it's absolutely chock-a-block, it's been published by Thomas Delmar Limited um, who's an auctioneer, produces very high quality catalogues for auctions of course and it's absolutely packed full of, I'll move this close to the camera, there we go, full of images that show English armour um, as well as, there you go, there's some brasses, some brass rubbings um, so that's quite early, that's 14th century in that case it's showing the basis um, there's, a, there's an actual um, tomb effigy in alabaster there um, got some big double spread images and it's got a huge amount of detail and Toby has also broken down these armors into time periods and types and um, that's very useful because it helps to delineate the changes that occurred um, between 1400 and 1450 and here we can see you know this section is just the the beginning of that it's 1400 to 1430 and armour did change quite a quite a bit between 1400 and 1430 and you can see we've got full page images beautifully produced and then we've got drawings produced especially for the book which show and these are, I found very very useful that's what's considered if you see up here 1400 to 1425 that's considered a sort of generic English harness so if you take the average of all of the actual historical harnesses shown in here then that might be considered an average of an English harness in 1400 to 1425 and it goes for each period you've got those uh, throughout the book there you go there's 1410 to 1425 that's another type of harness and we've got front side and back again the back and the side you don't normally see armours from that point of view if you're looking at brasses and effigies it's very common that you can't see the back so if you're trying to recreate an armour or even if you're an artist drawing someone you want to know what the back of an armour looks like what does it look like well this book can answer some of those questions and Toby has 
got those answers about what does the back of a cuirass in 1425 look like by looking at manuscripts which sometimes show the back of people, uh, by looking on the three-dimensional effigies um, and uh, looking at surviving pieces of armour where, where they do survive. Obviously there's almost no surviving English armour. There are a few pieces, there's the Coventry Salé and a few things like that. There's a few, uh, a few great bassinets surviving stuff like that, but there's very little um, surviving English armour from the 15th century. Almost all of the surviving armour from the 15th century, like 95% of it, is Italian and German. Um, so there we go again, that's 1410-1430, another type of common, a common assemblage of English harness. So, and it goes on and on, and it also separates the different uh, pieces of armour as well. It has a section on bassinet, um, a section on great bassinets, um, a section on gauntlets, a section on leg armour, um, and it really, it's got the minutiae as well, even down to how the hinges changed and the, uh, you know, the buckling points and uh, where the different things attached, how that changed over time. And Toby has looked for these details, and I'll just give you a flick through the book before I close it and just finish up you can see it's got absolutely tons and tons and tons of images and lots of text as well it's not just a picture book just huge huge amounts of information in there um, I just love this book and I have to say it's been living next to my bed for quite a while because as you guys know I like armour I have a couple of harnesses that I'm working on and that's the final thing I want to say as well is that Toby comes at this not just from the angle of being a museum curator and someone who likes to look at armour or um, you know look after it in museums but he also wears armour as many of my viewers will know Toby is a very respected jouster um, he's done a little bit of HEMA as well I've, I've trained a little bit with him and um, he, he has an insight into actually how armour works and how it's supposed to perform and why some of these changes rather than just saying you know they change from attaching the uh, the polyne to the to the crease in a certain way maybe why did they do that you know why is it better so uh, so as far as i'm concerned in the in the um, field of armour study, Toby is in a very unique position because not only of course is he the curator of one of the best armour collections, arms and armour collections in the UK, but he also uses the stuff just to a very high level and he's, you know, he knows lots of people involved with HEMA, he learns as much as he can about this kind of stuff. So it's really, really a fantastic book and I would say without a shadow of a doubt, the best book on armour regardless of whether you're particularly interested in English armour, but just the best book on medieval armour that has come out probably since Claude Blair's European armour of, I think it was like 1960-ish, 58, something like that. So um, really, if you're into armour, go and buy this book. I'll put a link below and um, hopefully Toby will get the next book out, I, I hope really soon, because I've read this through about three times and I'm ready for the next one now. And so there we go, it's like a, a bit like Game of Thrones building the, the tension for, <laughs> for the next volume. Cheers folks! Thank you for watching, please subscribe, follow us on Facebook, you can buy t-shirts through Spreadshirt, support us on Patreon or follow us on Pinterest. Thank you.